something uh, into consideration which uh, often is forgotten on the left, I find, uh, and that's the question of utopias. And uh, considering myself as uh, being in the Marxist tradition, there's an easy way to dismiss utopias, and uh, that is by pointing out that Comrade Frederick Engels wrote a pamphlet, uh, The Development of uh, Socialism from Utopia to Science. Uh, translation might be slightly different. I read it in, the, uh, in German. Uh, and ever since, um, Marxist socialists uh, tended to be very serious, very scientific. Just when asked by people, what are you aspiring, they often didn't have too much to deliver. And very often, the scientific socialism then collapsed into very abstract utopias, uh, something to the effect of, once we have a revolution, we will see what we have to do then. Um, and actually, there was a test uh, uh, about that theory and practice, and that was the German Revolution of 1918, um, when basically German monarchy more or less collapsed without resistance. Uh, they didn't even try to defend their system, but then the socialists, who knew so well why capitalism can't function, uh, they didn't qu knew quite as well how to build a different society, particularly how to organize a different kind of economy. And only after the revolution, they set up, well, what do you set up uh, if you don't know? A working group that sits down, and uh, it's like a study group. Uh, unfortunately, at the same time that the socialists sat down to try to work out how socialism actually might look like so that it delivers on its promises of helping uh, to improve uh, living and working conditions, um, those who didn't like socialism were pretty busy uh, re-establishing their power. What I'm telling uh, you here is that utopias actually are necessary. But a certain kind, I already mentioned, used these terms without pointing it out. Um, I talked about abstract utopias, and if they're abstract utopias, you might think they're also concrete uh, utopias. Uh, yes, and I think uh, that actually is the case. An abstract utopia is something, and this is why I made the reference to losing my religion. Um, all religions come up with a utopian uh, vision in the sense of, well, you might suffer on earth, but it will be much better in heaven. And that actually serves a purpose, particularly the purpose of those who have heaven on earth, which is uh, typically a tiny minority of the people, which I would call a, a ruling class, and the majority suffers. But as long as they believe they have a better life in heaven, they might let um, the tiny minority uh, get away with their heaven on earth. A concrete utopia, actually, uh, in contrast to that, would be one where you uh, could uh, precisely uh, define the steps that could be taken from the misery you find yourself in today, moving, walking into a better world of tomorrow, but really making sure that you don't dream about it all the time. Yes, you should also dream about the second step because that is necessary to give you direction if you don't have that kind of compass, uh, you might end up uh, uh, in a desert. So in that sense, this looking ahead is necessary, but you should also occasionally look where you set your feet uh, next, otherwise you might uh, um, fall into a hole and the whole kind of uh, endeavor collapses. And in that sense, uh, concrete utopias are important. Uh, and with hindsight, uh, reading lots of things, um, uh, talking with lots of people who were active uh, in the 68 uh, movement, uh, it occurs to me that there was more of an abstract utopia than a concrete utopia. What was unique about 1968? Uh, well, here is what I find unique. For one, it came out of a period of kind of collective Depression, not depression like it's talked about these days uh, in terms of the economy, but psychologically. If you pull out old Bob Dylan records um, and you listen to 
A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, I believe that was 1962, was written right after the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's dark. It's deep and dark. No hope in that song whatsoever. And then you listen to Like a Rolling Stone, five years later, 1967, and all the lyrics don't announce a better world. The music is so powerful, energetic, and full of hope. It's 100 degrees different from uh, what uh, the same Bobby Dylan um, had written five years ago. And one lesson you can draw from that, whenever you feel a little bit depressed, change, a change is going to come. Maybe. That's Sam Cooke, obviously. And here are some political conditions of uh, what I find was uh, unique about 1968. Uh, it seems to me that uh, what happened uh, in those years was an, something I would call an unfreezing of the Cold War condition. Um, during the Cold War, it seemed, yes, these three worlds, the First World, the Free West, the Soviet Empire, and then there was, was somehow the Third World, which didn't matter too much anyways, uh, because as Westerners, we were used to look at, uh, down upon them. Um, and this separation between three worlds, which also created a dense atmosphere internally, uh, in the sense that you can't ask for change, uh, because once you do that, either these impoverished masses from the South uh, invade your country, and there were signs of that, uh, which were called the Civil Rights Movement uh, uh, in the United States. Um, and if the black population of the United States starts uh, protesting, maybe the same is happening with the much larger numbers of people of color of the, from the Global South. Alternatively, or at the same time, the Soviets might invade us. Um, and that obviously had an impact, and people felt scared, and a hard rain's going to fall, actually expressed uh, all these anxieties. And in 1968, all of that was gone. The whole Cold War condition was falling apart. Uh, just kind of uh, to use symbols, uh, which allows me not to talk too much in detail about things, uh, there was the fer uh, famous uh, uprising in Paris. And there's lots of controversy whether uh, France really was on the verge of a revolution or not. Uh, but there can be no doubt that in 1967, nobody would have expected to see a general strike uh, just one year later in France. That was enormously inspiring. And actually, it was a general strike, something academic Marxists uh, sitting in their seminar rooms were always dreaming about reading Karl Marx and reading and talking about workers um, instead of engaging with them. Well, Paris students were lucky. It was not just Cartier Latin. Uh, it was also workers who went on strike. And that was enormously inspiring for young radicals. Uh, actually existing workers uh, doing what they are supposed to do according to the theory they just had discussed. Then there was Prague, the Prague Spring, uh, the attempt to create uh, socialism with a human um, face. I think one cannot underestimate the kind of uh, devastating impact it had when the hopes of the uh, Russian Revolution of 1917 led to Stalinism and to a kind of uh, system which some people said it wasn't socialism to begin with, uh, and others said, yes, it is, and uh, Soviet leaders themselves said, it, yeah, well, this is actually existing socialism, uh, talking about utopian visions a little bit earlier, well, the Soviet Union certainly couldn't claim to represent any kind of hope. Um, I grew up in uh, West Germany, right on the border of East Germany, and I have been in East Germany regularly. Uh, I can tell you East German workers were not fond of, the, uh, of their own, supposedly their own uh, state. They weren't. That was not a source of inspiration. But the Prague Spring, that was a source of inspiration. Whether it could have been successful, we will never know, because it was crushed by Soviet tanks. Um, but in 1968, there was this idea 
workers in Paris, workers in Prague, they rise up against the powers uh, that seemed all powerful just a year ago. Uh, unfortunately, um, this unfreezing of the Cold War condition and the underlying more belief than knowledge that economic and ecological pro, uh, problems don't exist um, led to a situation where abstract utopias uh, took over in the progressive movements and actually this although I'm not saying there was a conscious plan to do so, just some people on the right were smart enough to exploit some of the utopias that were uh, expressed by uh, the 1968 movements, uh, and that led into neoliberalism. If you look uh, into the ideas of neoliberalism, they all sound very good. It's all about liberty. And that's actually pretty much what most radicals uh, in the late 60s were talking about, uh, believing that economic problems don't matter anymore. Those problems will be solved. You could talk about liberation, self-identification, self-liberation. Uh, well, and neoliberals uh, took that agenda and said, yeah, and actually we can tell you where you can do all that, where you can liberate yourself, and it's called the marketplace. A marketplace is basically an, in, or a market is an institution where everybody can um, live according to his or her needs. Sounds almost like communism, right? Uh, just in a market society. Um, and the difference between communism and this kind of neoliberalism is that the concept of scarcity was brought back onto the agenda. Um, and that became possible in the 70s uh, due to two factors. One, the so-called oil price shock. And emotionally, psychologically, it was a shock. Um, that oil could be expensive uh, was something nobody had uh, ever considered uh, since um, economies had switched from using largely coal, uh, coal to mostly using oil. And all of a sudden, it was expensive. Uh, and it could be argued, uh, well, maybe at some point we won't have it. Uh, and also there was a world economic crisis in the 70s, uh, not of the same scale as in the 30s, but for people who were used to prosperity, it was quite a, another shock. And what smart neoliberals did was um, that they used concepts um, that were introduced by the envi environmental movements of the 70s that sprang up at the same time that oil became expensive. The same year, 1973, first oil shock, uh, the first report issued by the Club of Rome came out and it was aptly called limits to growth. Uh, and the environmental movements criticizing the productivism, the industrial model of the first world and of the second world and actually the model that the third world uh, wanted to uh, have for themselves, uh, saying we need sustainability. And I think uh, today uh, there's no dispute uh, that we need that, uh, otherwise we won't survive. However, neoliberals, they didn't care about Mother Earth uh, altogether, but they happily used the term sustainability and put it into a different concept, uh, context, and that context was the budget, the state budget. We have to have a sustainable public budget. And that's the argument uh, whenever somebody asks for public services, no, 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 you can't have that because then our budget is not sustainable. Uh, so the concepts of scarcity were reintroduced by neoliberalism and kind of propped up with this utopian, abstract utopian vision of in a marketplace, everybody can do what he or she wants. If only you recognize the restrictions that are given by the market. Um, and the restrictions, that's uh, not uh, said open well. Over the years, it was uh, said more openly. Uh, those restrictions uh, are called the claim for profit of some people. You can do whatever you want as long as it helps others to make a profit. And if it doesn't help them to make a profit, then unfortunately you really can't have it. Um, and in that sense, um, the 
neoliberal counter-revolution or counter-reform, however you want to call it, um, that really came out of the failure of the 96 to Ada movement, and I'm not using the term failure here to indicate that individually uh, people have failed and the, or that they were traitors. Uh, probably there were lots of them. Um, unfortunately, I can't swear at them because they wouldn't come to conferences uh, such as these, right? Uh, uh, they made their careers and don't care anymore anyways. These days they might care about the loss uh, uh, they're facing due to the financial crisis. Um, but looking back at the development since uh, the late 60s, I think one can clearly see that quite successfully um, two things were merged, the claim for profit and some of the utopian visions uh, that uh, very spontaneously had been expressed by the 60 Ada movement. Um, I should conclude, which I will do right now, uh, and of course I have to end on an optimistic, on a positive note, uh, since this thing is called regaining our imagination and not uh, understanding why we can't have it in the first place. Um, and this optimistic note goes as follows. Those on the left who have seen their move, the movements with which they grew up politically withering away and have remained on the left, well, they can, with Rosa Luxemburg, uh, do what really may bring progress learning from their failures and maybe sharing it with others. Um, and in this regard, they have one advantage over neoliberals because neoliberals were invincible until last year, last summer. And then the economic crisis kind of started and for a year they were thinking, well, maybe it won't come. But definitely since September 2008, the neoliberal uh, abstract utopia has just evaporated. Uh, as stock markets went down, um, their utopian vision evaporated into thin air, uh, with reference to uh, similar formulations uh, issued by Marx and Engels. Uh, and they don't know how to cope with that kind of failure because they haven't experienced that for 30 years. For 30 years, uh, they were moving forward. Um, they saw the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, to which degree they really managed to accomplish that, uh, and to which degree uh, the internal problems of the Soviet Union caused that is a different discussion, uh, which we don't have to uh, engage in here. But for neoliberals, it was just one basic step, and also with smaller steps, they had succeeded to roll back the welfare state uh, in all the rich countries, and also they had uh, managed to destroy the uh, liberation movements uh, in the third world. So they were used to win on every front, uh, from Paris to Prague uh, to Vietnam. But now, in the heart of their system, which is called Wall Street, um, they see some failure which was not, not imposed onto them um, by their enemies, by their adversaries, by uh, struggling uh, um, working classes or other social movements, but by, their own by the contradictions of their own economic system. Uh, they were confronted with the uh, limits to neoliberalism, um, not knowing how to deal with failure. At this point, they really don't know exactly where to go. If uh, we manage to use that and turn it into um, a resource to re-energize ourselves by uh, trying to engage with young ones who express hope. They expressed hope at the ballot box um, uh, in the uh, States just a few days ago. Uh, and behind that, it seems to me there's a desire for change, uh, which obviously is necessary to bring about change. I talked about the uh, usefulness of concrete utopias earlier. And uh, if I dare to say we share our failures uh, with you and after that you will exactly know, know, know how not to do it and that might be a step forward. Thank you very much. <laughs>